We're an island nation, drawn to the sea that surrounds us. A playground for some. For others, it's where they make their living. But the sea's unpredictable. It's Mother Nature, it's a beast. There to save our lives is a volunteer army of over 5,000 ordinary people. Cheers, mate. Ready to leave their jobs, their families, and race to our rescue. When the Pedro goes, it's that adrenaline rush every single time. You could make the difference between life and death. I feel very lucky. Then bringing me back to life again was a miracle. OK. Equipped with their own cameras. Just the two of you. Come on, yes. The crews give us a unique insight into every call-out. Nice deep breaths, OK? Oh, no. As only they see it. The ambulance is here, OK? For those who risk their lives, it has become a way of life. Come on! You have to do your best because somebody's family are relying on you to save them. Lying on the coast of North Wales is the walled market town of Conway. Conway is a place where literally the mountains meet the sea. It's stunning beauty. It's built around the castle. Directly beneath the town's medieval castle is the lifeboat station, established in 1966. From here, the crews launch their D-class inshore lifeboat into the busy waters of the River Conway. The river in Conway is very important to the town. In the summer, it attracts a lot of tourism, um, people who have never been to a seaside town in there uh, before. The rise of tourism and leisure in the 1960s was one of the main reasons a lifeboat station was established in Conway. And the town has remained popular with holiday makers ever since. In the summer months, um, it is the busiest time of the year for the town. West Shore Beach, it's a lovely two-mile stretch of beach. It's really, really nice there. When the sun's out, the sea's flat, it can get really, really busy. I love Conway. It's just a quaint place to be. It's a lovely place to live. People are very friendly, very welcoming. Hi, Karen. You OK? How are you doing? Hi. Smashing. Steve moved to Conway with his family 17 years ago. As the station's deputy launch authority, he knows the dangers of this coastline all too well. The thing about Conway that people have to realise is that it's a river and it goes out to the sea. So when the tide goes out, it exposes all the local sandbanks and everyone thinks it's a beach, but it really isn't. The public are just unaware of how dangerous it can be on the sandbank. The tide goes out about a mile and a half, two mile, and the public just walk out not knowing 200 yards from the beach, the tide's coming in behind them. On a spring tide, the water coming into the river uh, can, can be quite significant. When the tide turns and it starts to come in, it doesn't race in for the first hour. But the second hour, it starts to. And the third hour, believe me, it really does. A warm Sunday in September. Temperatures are hitting 24 degrees. The tide has recently turned and is now on its way in. Knowing the time of the tide, you've always got one thought in your mind that uh, we could end up going out here to people uh, on sandbanks. I was down at the station just sorting some paperwork out, ready to go home to celebrate my son's 17th birthday. And then the pager went off, and it was immediate launch. The Coast Guard has received multiple 999 calls. When the pager goes off and it's immediate launch, you know someone's in trouble. A man and two children have been cut off by the tide at the far end of West Shore Beach, three miles northwest of the lifeboat station. Conway's D-Class is prepared for launch. It was pretty clear that uh, we needed to get the boat in the water as soon as possible. The crew have been informed that one of the casualties has managed to swim back to shore, but two people are still in trouble in the water. 
When we launch to a casualty on the sandbanks, it is time critical because the sandbanks are very unpredictable. They do move. High tide is in just over an hour, so the sea is now surging in at its fastest, bringing with it cold water from the depths of the Irish Sea. Olive Coast Guard, Conway LB, ETA, five minutes over. The atmosphere when we're launching, the adrenaline's pumping, everyone knows they've got a job to do. Two people there now by Black Rock. As the crew speed up the estuary, another Coast Guard update comes in over the radio. The remaining casualties are the man and a 10-year-old boy. Knowing that one of the casualties was a child and not knowing could they swim, could they not swim, I don't know, it just gets you going. It gets the adrenaline going more. My fears when we get called to a sandbank is that we are going to be too late. The dynamics change in the boat a lot when there's a child involved. You hope it's going to be a good outcome and you are able to get to the casualties, um, but that might not always be the case. The D-Class has a top speed of over 25 miles an hour, but the boat is having to fight against the incoming tide. It felt like you weren't going quick enough, but looking down at the speed, we were flat out. We were flat out. Fears for the people, it's... It's fear of drowning, it. Just making sure they get back to the loved ones. Make sure it doesn't happen. Five minutes after launching, the crew approached the casualty's last reported position. They're waiting there. They're, they're straight ahead. We heard shouting ashore to where the two casualties were in the water. Got my help, we're just arriving on scene. Two people in water, one child. The man and the young boy are now over 100 metres from shore, up to their necks in the water. We could hear the casualty saying, I, I, I can't touch bottom, I can't touch bottom. The man was trying his best to keep the little boy afloat. Do you want me to get out, because there's a kid there? Yeah. OK, when you... I'll go out, mate. OK. You OK? I entered the water to get the child up and made sure the other casualty was supported. Because once the adrenaline lets go, we didn't want him going down. Three, two, one. Once they see the lifeboat, they just give up. And they're the ones we need to watch. You OK, yeah? You drank any water? Yeah, the boat came in. It was more cold with the child. He seemed to know where he was. The main concern was for the adult. Uh, he just wasn't with it. Just put that round you a little bit, mate. And just keep the wind off you. On the way back, the adult casualty, he wasn't talking at all. His colour was draining out of him. He was going downhill and he was going downhill quick. Five minutes after pulling the man and boy from the water, the D-Class approaches the lifeboat station. Come with boathouse, come LB, ETA, 30 seconds. Can we get some blankets and straight into the boathouse, over? Oh, my head. You OK? I'm sorry. Mate, there's no, need to, to Matt. there's no need to be sorry, mate. There's no need to be sorry. Once we got back to the station, we call it a hot recovery where the boat is on the trailer and it goes straight back into the boathouse and we can assess him more. Roger, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. The child, once we got him back to station and we he had some blankets and some drinks, he he started to perk up. Jamie. Hey, mate, come over this side, just put your bum on there. So some of the crew members took him outside. Okay. Well, got some blankets up, yeah. The adult, we tried to get him off the boat. Uh, he just couldn't get off. No, you mate. It's so all right, mate. There's no rush, OK? <laughs> hey, there's no rush. It was like a tap being turned off. His colour just started draining out of him. Right. Do you want some water? Do you a little bit? Salty. Yeah. The casualty was obviously in a state of distress, uh, cold. Do you feel that you can... Swimming. Mate, you just take your time nice and calm, right? And I think that at that point, his, his well-being went... Um, 
went down significantly. While waiting for the paramedics to arrive, the crew moved the man to the privacy of the operations room. Uh, two sacks, mate. <coughs> we knew we had to stabilise the um, casualties' um, condition. <coughs> the casualty had taken on a significant amount of water. He was bringing up quite an amount. <coughs> there could be secondary drowning, and it's something that you've got to be extremely careful of. When a casualty has struggled in the sea, they can inhale water into the lungs. This can cause the lungs to collapse, leading to what's known as secondary drowning, which is potentially fatal. We got the oxygen um, from the boat, which did help. And we had a paramedic that came to do a further assessment of the casualty. You guys are amazing, by the way. I'm telling you, you're, you're all amazing. You could see by his body, he was, he was getting a bit warmer. The colour started coming back. Uh, he started talking a little bit more sense. Uh, yeah, he was he was making recovery. After an anxious 20-minute drive from the beach, the casualties' family and friends arrive at the station. When the family arrived, it was a very uh, moving experience, purely and simply because they were emotional, the casualties were emotional, and, yeah, it was uh, quite a, a charged atmosphere at that point. I just got to the point where I thought, this is it. There is no coming back from this. I'm going to drown and I'm done for. This is the end of my life. That was my thought. That's the end of it. Taking advantage of the sunny weather, Alex and his fiancée had come to the beach with a group of friends, including two children, Stacy and Jamie. I hadn't been to West Shore Beach before. It was a lovely day, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable. Stacey and Jamie were very excited to get out in the water. We walked a long, long way to get to the sea. So this is me in the sea in September, and it's glorious. Check this out. Incredible. But unbeknown to Alex, the tide was coming in all around them, rising a foot every 20 minutes. It was so calm and beautiful. The children are having fun. No. No. And then we turn around and the water is so far in. And that became very serious very quickly. And I, and I tried to keep, I'm getting goosebumps now, tried to keep very calm with the children. I said, right, we need to make our way back in now. We moved and all of a sudden it was as if somebody had taken the sea floor away and just disappeared under the water. Instant panic, knowing that these children, other people's children, you've got their lives in your hands. Very scary. Overcome by panic and shocked by the depth of the water, Alex struggled to make any headway against the fast flowing tide. We can see the beach and I'm thinking, why can't we just get there? Every time I tried to swim, I'd end up almost going sort of sideways and a little bit further out. The other child with Alex, Stacy, managed to make it ashore through the currents and raised the alarm. Every time I tried to swim, Jamie would panic, which would sort of push me under the water. It's not his fault. Alex was now completely out of his depth and battling to keep himself and Jamie afloat. All I could do was try and tread water, and, and even if I'm going under, try and keep him way up. I can feel myself going under the water more and more and more, and I'm taking on more and more water. I think what kept me fighting was having that responsibility of keeping him alive. I absolutely think I'd got somebody watching over me because right in the distance, I could see a boat coming along. Two people in water, one child. 
The one crew member jumps in the water straight away, Jamie in the boat. OK. Huge, huge relief. Jamie's safe with them. But once on board the lifeboat, Alex's fight to save both himself and Jamie began to take its toll. Because that adrenaline that had kept us calm in the water to try and keep us safe, that was sort of draining away. I'd got, I'd got nothing left, physically or mentally. No, you mate. It's all right, there's no rush, OK? I felt like it was my fault we'd ended up where we were. I, I hadn't done any sort of research into tides or this, that and the other. I felt like a jigsaw that just fell to pieces. Yeah, what's the mother's name, mate? It was such an overwhelming experience. It was a very emotional reunion when the family arrived at the station. It made me feel very proud that we were able to do that. My fiance, she is my whole world. The relief of seeing her, the shock of seeing her again, when I, I sorry. Uh, I, I never thought I, I would see her again. The level of fear that this is the end of life was so immense and it happens so quickly and such a scary situation to be in. Alex and Jamie were taken to Glan Cluid Hospital, 15 miles away, where they had chest x-rays for symptoms of secondary drowning. They were discharged with a clean bill of health later that day. Thanks to the crew members, without them, no way we, we would, have, uh, would, have, would have survived, I, I really don't think. Every time there's an incident where people are taken out of the water just in the nick of time, we're all proud of the fact that we had a positive outcome and everyone was OK. We got the boat, cleaned it, got everything ready for service again, and then made my way home for my son's birthday. And there was a nice bit of birthday cake waiting for me. They'd, they'd actually waited for me this time. Every time any of the 400 lifeboats across the UK and Ireland are called out on a shout, the crews on board must manage a whole range of emotions and face their fears. It's quietly very nervous. I almost want to say frightened. You leave the house and you're thinking about what is the situation I'm going for. And your biggest fear is making a mistake and making a mistake that, that you know, has consequences. Come on! Come on! Thank you, thank you. I don't know that I necessarily conquer fears. Three, two, one. It's just really important to keep those fears, if you have them, at, at bay so that the casualty doesn't pick that up. Right, dump your anchor line, guys. OK, they're free. When you've got that responsibility to save somebody's life, it's a moment that kind of churns your stomach up. One at a time, one at a time, one at a time. Slowly, slowly, slowly. Things can change. Uh, the weather, the sea state. So you do have to conquer the fears that you've got. We're there for one reason, and that's to save people that are in peril at sea. If anybody who goes out and says, they're not afraid of certain sea conditions or weather conditions. I mean, personally, I think they're probably telling a big porky. Just over 30 miles east along the Welsh coast from Conway, lying on the banks of the River Dee, is the community of Flint. Flint's quite a small town, but when you live in Flint, it, you feel part of a bigger thing. It's an industrial town, home to workers of the old steelworks. The Dee is one of just a handful of rivers in the United Kingdom, which form a border between two countries. In this case, England and Wales. It is quite close to England, yeah. We can see the other side, which is the Wirral. Croesaw a Cymru. That's welcome to Wales. My children, they speak fluent Welsh. They say a lot of things about me that I don't quite understand, but we'll leave it at that. <laughs> We're very much Welsh at heart. Alongside working at a nearby manufacturing plant and volunteering on the lifeboat, 
Nathan also finds time to be a mountain guide in the UK and across Europe. Climbing mountains has always been a hobby of mine. There's certainly a lot of transferable skills from the lifeboat to the mountain environment and from the mountain environment to the lifeboat. Leadership is something that you could take anywhere you go. Challenges such as Snowden at night into gale force winds and rain and you've got a small group of people's lives in your hands to look after them through that, there's nothing better. The adrenaline rush that you get from climbing a mountain, it's a bit of a slow burner. When you're being paged in the middle of the night to attend a lifeboat shout, it's very full on and it hits you and it hits you hard. November, a cold, dark night. I believe the pages went off just after one o'clock in the morning. For me, when the pager goes off at night, it is like an on-off switch. When that pager does go off, we've got no information. We just need to get to the station. A mayday call has been received from five miles up river. A 20-foot yacht had collided with the Harden Rail Bridge. So we were like, oh, wow, that's different. Harden is a working railway bridge, with trains regularly running across it in daytime hours. Um, so our mission right now is to go and find that vessel for dynamically risk assess from there. OK. My initial thoughts when I was told there was a yacht stuck under the bridge was that a yacht has broke its moorings. It was quite surprising for us, generally all yachts, due to the confined space of the river, don't come down that far. OK, Peter. While Flint's D-Class inshore lifeboat is readied for launch, with Nathan as helm, an update comes in from the Coast Guard. Someone is still on board the stricken vessel. OK, on my count, one, two, three, turn around. Once we were informed somebody was on board, the situation changed completely. Um, we were there to save a life. OK, pods on. There's an urgency to get there as quickly as we can. Searchlights, folks, come on. I need to see. It can be very difficult when it's dark. We do have to be more in our game. It's dangerous. There's a lot of sandbanks on the estuary, so you've really got to be looking out at all times. On the sides, mate, let's see the banks. It would usually take the D-Class just a few minutes to reach the railway bridge. But in darkness, the crew can't go at top speed. There's quite a few structures poking out of the water, which are difficult to see during the day, never mind the night. And it's really important that we'd navigated the boat through uh, the deepest part of the channel just to get there safely. Nearly five minutes after launching, the crew approached the bridge. And it was only until we got very close we were able to use our searchlights, and we just couldn't believe what we saw. Any lines underneath that mast, guys? Listing at 45 degrees underneath the bridge. I just thought, wow, <laughs> what are we going to do with this one? When the casualty stood on the deck, we could see he was really struggling to stand up. Good morning. He was in a very dangerous predicament. With its mast wedged against the bridge, the yacht is in danger of being capsized by the fast flowing tide. The river temperature is just nine degrees at this time of year. If the casualty ends up in the water, he could be overcome by cold water shock within minutes. Uh, right, what we're going to do, mate, is we're going to get you off first. The mast was tangled up above. You could see the entire hull listed to one side. Couldn't, it couldn't have been a good place to be in. You got a life jacket on, mate, yeah? The position of the vessel was unbelievable. It really was on, like, a knife edge. The priority was to get this casualty off the vessel. As quick as you can, mate, and as safely as you can, yeah. make your way onto the boat. The casualty seemed quite calm. Everybody does put on a bit of a brave face uh, in the face of adversity. 
Are you hurting anyway, mate? <laughs> no, no, but no, I, yeah, I was asleep. Yeah. I just woke up with a big bang and then oh, yeah. I was here. Oh, right, guys, let's get some warm gear on this guy, please. With the casualty now on board the lifeboat, yes, crew ready. The crew rush him to the care of the Coast Guard team on shore. Can I have one searchlight on the slip, please? Yeah. Uh, Cheers, thank you. Hey, not a problem, mate. It was peace of mind that we'd um, dealt with the most important part of the job. You don't get this kind of service every shout, bud, all right? Although the yacht owner is now safe, his boat is still in an extremely precarious position under the bridge. We needed to come up with a plan of how we were going to recover this yacht. Not only is the yacht a navigational hazard, trains are due to start running along this busy stretch of railway within a matter of hours. But until the yacht is freed and the bridge made safe, the train line has been shut down. It was in an extremely dangerous position. It could either free itself or it could get worse um, and take on a lot of water. Let's look out for any lines leading in, see if we can get things out of the way. However cautious the crew may be, attempting to release a large yacht from under a bridge in darkness in a fast-flowing river is a risky endeavour. My initial concerns were lines in the water which could wrap around our propeller and become a danger to us. So the first thing we decided to do was secure the lines on the boat. OK, see what the situation is with that anchor. The yacht's anchor appears to have fallen overboard, holding the boat in its position under the bridge. Nathan asked me to pull the anchor up to try to recover it. And probably the most scary part of that was when I released that anchor, someone could get hurt here. The main concern was the boat tipping further. It was that movement of that yacht that was the most dangerous path. My heart was beating pretty fast pulling that anchor up. OK. We backed off just to see what would happen. Let go of that line, Gav. And that's when the situation changed quite unexpectedly. I remember hearing a sound up above me, um, quite a loud banging noise. Prepare for a stern toe, folks. We just watched the boat right itself, um, just sort of took itself from, from underneath the railings and then became a boat adrift. OK, let's grab a hold of that vessel as soon as you can, both of you on the port side. Grab the bars. Let's make this operation as quick as we can, please. With the yacht now freed from the bridge, the crew can set up a tow and reunite it with its owner. It's probably the most scariest thing that's ever happened to me in my life uh, that, that night. I woke up to a big bang, and then the next thing I felt is the boat lift up and it, it, go, it went on its side like a fair ride. Earlier that day, Phil had moored his yacht in the river just over a mile from the bridge. While waiting for the tide to come in so he could return ashore, he was rudely awakened from a nap. So I rolled out of bed, all the stuff fell out the lockers, hit me and that. It took me a while to be able to see, you know, in the dark, my eyes to adjust, and then I realised I was stuck under the, the train bridge. The mast had caught the bridge at the top and the boat had carried on under the bridge. The tide was obviously rushing in. I was panicking. I could see bits of wood and rubbish going past really fast in, with the current. The boat was listing, the water was coming up. I thought it wouldn't have been long until it came over the side. It was terrifying. Because the higher the tide went, also the more the boat lifted on its side. It was just getting worse and worse and worse. At all costs, I didn't want to go in that water. November's not the best time to go in it. Fortunately, Phil managed to make a mayday call. I could see lights coming up the river. Shine a light on the vessel for me. Like headlights on a car, but it was um, the oil and I. 
relief. It was relief. Once I got onto that lifeboat, I, I knew then straight away I'd had a lucky escape. Aside from some mild shock, Phil was unharmed. And 45 minutes later, just before 4 a.m., the lifeboat crew returned with his yacht. I'd just like to say it's the best alongside tow I have ever seen. Nice. It was a successful shout. The, the casualty was safe, and so was the casualty vessel, and that was the ultimate goal for me. Happy days. Afterwards, I still couldn't believe quite what happened, really. Yeah, it was something different. It's the first one for me. I've never dealt with a yacht that had collided with a bridge before. Extremely grateful to get out of bed in the middle of the night and then come, come down and rescue someone stuck on a river, you know. For no money is amazing. Nearly 150 miles southwest, on the wild coast of North Devon, lies the harbour town of Ilfracoom. Ilfracoom is a very picturesque little fishing port. In its heyday, Ilfracoom was a very popular Victorian destination. Back in those days, the posh Victorians came here just to uh, take the waters, as they say. From Easter Bank Holiday all the way through to the end of September, it is very busy here. Ilfracombe is a beautiful town to live in. We have cliffs and rocks and cosy coves we can go to. It's just beautiful. Ilfracombe's lifeboat station was established in 1866, when the town was at the height of its Victorian popularity. Back then, the crew would mainly have come from seafaring professions, but nowadays, they're from all walks of life. We've got builders, doctors, a couple of people that are in the NHS. The uniqueness of having different um, characters on a crew, obviously everyone bounces off each other, so yeah, it's good. The cruise patch covers the dangerous and unpredictable waters of the Bristol Channel. The conditions can change quite quickly within minutes. We've got the second biggest tidal range in the world. So I think Canada's first, and then we, we're second. Another feature of this coastline is Great Hangman, at 800 feet, the highest sea cliff in England. The tidal race around sort of Hangman is quite strong. We quite often get kayakers that get fatigued in that area, and then they'll get caught in a tide and start getting pushed up channel. Mid-June. A mild Saturday morning, a fresh southeasterly wind has created choppy conditions in the seas off Ilfracoo. It was a nice day in the summer and uh, was just kind of doing some gardening and then the pager went off. I don't remember what I was doing in this case when a pager went, but it's bound to have been at the most inconvenient time because it normally is. Coast Guard has received a distress call from approximately four miles due east of the lifeboat station, off the coast near the Hangman Cliffs. The first bit of information we had was it was a person in the water, and uh, we knew this from a DSC call. DSC stands for Digital Selective Calling. When a specific button on a VHF radio is pressed, a mayday is immediately sent out. Ilfracombe's D-Class inshore lifeboat is launched within minutes. In this case, it just sent a distress signal with uh, the person's position and uh, the fact they were in the water. Falmouth Coast Guard, this is Ilfracombe ILB, Ilfracombe ILB on Channel 1, 6, over. All the crew have to work with is the Mayday alert and the location of the VHF radio when the distress signal was sent. But they have no idea where the casualty is now. When we go out for a shout like this, we prepare for having someone possibly drowned or in danger. ETA 10. The warmest the water gets in the Bristol Channel. In June time, you're normally talking about 12, 13 degrees. 
With the Mayday call sent out, a Coast Guard rescue helicopter has also now been scrambled from New Quay, 70 miles southwest. Helicopter as well. You go as fast as possible. We as the crew are the limits, not the boat itself. We just kind of hold on and try to push ourselves as much as possible because we know their life is in our hands at that time. So the sea conditions on the day were uh, short, sharp, choppy seas. It can be a bit painful for your knees on the inshore. As soon as we got Hangman in sight, there's always the looking aspect of trying to find this person as soon as possible. Something there, but that could be a pot boy. started looking for the casualties in the water. We couldn't see anything, and you always start wondering which way they'd gone. Um, you're paying attention to where the wind's blowing, where the boat's drifting. Uh, Coast Guard, Coast Guard. The tide is currently rushing in, so the casualty could well be swept up the Bristol Channel. Quite often, the tide is going four or five knots, and uh, people can move a, a number of miles within an hour just by drifting with the tide. Fortunately for the lifeboat crew, there's now another set of eyes scouring the seas from above. Seeing the helicopter is always a big relief because even if they can't go down to the casualty, they support us um, with the overview and with more information. Right hang on, little hang on. Huh? Right hang on, little hang on. Oh, no. After five minutes of anxiously scanning the sea and cliffs for any sign of life, there's a possible breakthrough. Kayaker on the beach. We got an update. There are kayakers on the beach, and they might be the casualties. Thomas, do we know they are the casualties of her? Stuart at the helm decided that I was going to go ashore and assess what was going on. See if anyone needed any medical assistance. This is the man who raised the alarm after capsizing offshore. Having been in the sea for nearly an hour, he's been brought to this cove by his fellow kayaker. The gentleman that had been in the water was very cold and he was very pale. You could tell he was in shock. Gentleman's wearing off, buddy. Yeah. yeah. Shock can be quite dangerous because your heart beats faster and the adrenaline wears off when someone's on scene to help you. And we do get casualties now and then that do faint. While the crew leave the other kayaker to make his own way back. He'll jump and sit in the front and you'll get a bit of shelter from the wind then. The casualty is put aboard the D-Class. We were quite surprised. It was a cold day and he was only wearing his shorts and T-shirt at the time. He did say he wished he'd brought his wetsuit. You feel a bit warmer now? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. You don't look so... Yeah, I'm not... No. He was shivering a bit and uh, he just didn't look right. So, um, like, he looked like someone who has been through a quite stressful situation. To get him warmed up as soon as possible, the casualty is taken ashore at the neighboring Coombe Martin Beach. No, I actually thought I'm going to die today. I could just feel everything slipping away. That morning, keen angler Matt had made his very first excursion out to sea on a kayak. I've always been into fishing. I always wondered about getting further out, what I might catch, and that was why I decided to buy a kayak. Once he'd got all the gear needed for a fishing trip aboard his new purchase, Matt contacted a local sea kayaking group. A chap called Barry agreed to come out with me on my first trip. I happened to be off call and off duty, and yeah, we agreed to, to meet up that morning at Coombe Martin and, and go fishing together. Originally from South Africa, firefighter Barry is a seasoned kayaker. He had all the gear, uh, it looked like he knew what he was doing. Where I thought it was a little bit odd was him not wearing a wetsuit at all. It was about 
15, 16 degrees, the sun was out, so I decided to go out in shorts and T-shirt, and it was actually my first mistake, really. Yeah, it was a big mistake. Wanting a record of his maiden sea voyage, Matt attached a camera to the bow of his kayak. We set off into this crystal clear water. It was the perfect day. Yeah, is this uh, what you consider choppy then? I mean, I've been out in worse. Yeah. If you see where those white horses are starting to whip up, I wouldn't go further than those white horses. That first hour we were out there, the kayak was moving more and more and I was struggling. Um, it changed so quickly and I knew it could, but I wasn't expecting it to. Feeling confident that Matt could cope with the conditions in this part of the bay, Barry suggested they stop and cast out their lines. I'm going to set up anchor and then start fishing. Yeah. I was just about to deploy my, my anchor and then Matt was going to get his anchor, which he stowed behind him. It's at this point when everything went wrong, I put my paddle down and I reached around behind my seat and that's when I was hit side on by a wave. I just heard this splash and Matt had gone over in an instant. Within a second, he was gone. The water was so cold, it took my breath away. Um, it was like daggers all over my body. As Matt went in the water, I wasn't concerned. I was like, we're going to right the boat, and he's going to get back on. With all my fishing gear, it did take a fair few minutes to get this kayak back over. Um, there's different techniques you can use, but again, things I should have learned. I started getting a little bit concerned when he couldn't get back on because he just said to me, I can't do it, I can't do it. The effort I needed to get out of the water, it was immense, and this is when I started to panic. It was very much being like in a washing machine, bouncing between his kayak and my kayak. Um, nothing was staying still. I could see the cold was starting to affect him because he, his breathing rate increased. He's got no more energy left. He thought he was going to die. I, I could see in his eyes he was getting a bit panicky now. After struggling in the cold water for over 45 minutes, Matt was losing his strength. Barry decided to rope their kayaks together and haul both Matt and his kayak ashore. The wind had picked up by now and it was blowing right in my face. It was against me, against the tidal flow. It was choppy. It was hard work because I was carrying my kayak, towing his kayak with Matt, holding on to me as well. Swim on your own, leave the boat, I'll pop the boat. Swim on your own. He started swimming and just got too tired, and the current was now pulling him back out to Great Angman. I was absolutely exhausted. The cold had got to me so bad, and I just felt so heavy. I felt like I was sinking. It was the closest I felt to, you know, not making it out of this. Um, I thought that I'd been in the water now nearly an hour. I was absolutely petrified at this point. Sheer panic and fear, basically. I just saw myself sinking to the bottom and, yeah, drowning, basically. The only thing I could do, which was push the, the mayday button on the radio. By now, despite the strong currents and the wind, Barry had been able to tow Matt and his kayak to within sight of a small cove. His time was running out then. I thought, if I don't get him to that beach now, we're going to be in a world of pain, because he's just getting less interested in surviving, really. It was the most surreal moment once we hit that beach, because, you know, he was relieved, and I just shook his hand. I'm on land, and Barry has saved me, basically. And we had a little moment. Fortunately for them both, Matt's DSC Mayday call had been picked up by the Coast Guard, and help was on its way. I could see this rib and a helicopter above me. The emotions just came flooding because I knew that no matter what now, I was going to be OK, you know. 
Personally, I don't think I saved his life. It was a team effort between the two of us to get him to safety. So that button there is a lifesaver, literally. I didn't want to admit I was in trouble. And I think that's why I held back for so long, pushing the button, because I didn't want to cause all the trouble, the drama, the putting people at risk for my stupidity, basically. There you go. After being checked over by the Coast Guard team on the beach, Matt was deemed well enough to make his way home. So I would urge anyone to, to buy a radio with the DC button. If you're in immediate danger, just press the button and call for help. We just popped past the other kayaker to make sure he was all right and he was still happy to fish. You all right? Yeah, he's back on the beach. We're just checking you're all right and happy. I didn't catch a single thing. I didn't even get a bite. And that, that frustrated me. <laughs> that was very frustrating. I mean, I'm not going to lie, it, it really put me off. And um, I just, I was so grateful that the people were there that day. Two hundred and forty miles due east, on the picturesque Kent coast, is the small seaside town of Warmer. We're on the furthest southeast point of as you could possibly get in England, in between Dover and Ramsgate. We're in our own little bubble, I'd say. Warmer is a sort of a mainly a, a seafront, few local shops, a couple of pubs, just a lovely place to live. The line where the English Channel meets the North Sea lies just offshore of Walmer. So the local waters can be challenging. Where we are, we're exposed. The town can take a battering on certain weathers, certain tides. Just under 10 miles south of the town is the Strait of Dover, the busiest shipping route in the world, with over 400 commercial vessels heading to France and beyond every day. You wouldn't believe how many vessels are going backwards and forwards on our patch, really. It's, uh, yeah, very busy. The crews here have two inshore lifeboats, an Atlantic B-Class and a smaller D-Class. But their position on this stretch of coast means they can get tasked to shouts far out to sea. There are circumstances that the weather is beyond the capabilities of the two boats that we have then the flank stations of either Ramsgate or Dover would, would be called as they have the all-weather lifeboats. A still, calm weekend in August. At four o'clock in the morning, the local Coast Guard receives a Mayday emergency call. No one wants to hear a Mayday out at sea. I mean, it is the worst, worst call out that you can hear. Basically, life or death. A hundred-year-old wooden barge is starting to sink in the middle of the English Channel, with two crews still on board. It is the highest form of distress, and they're putting that out because they obviously fear for their life. If the boat's taken on water, I mean, it's, it can be catastrophic. Within minutes, Warmer's Atlantic class is launching out to sea. One minute, you're fast asleep. Half an hour later, you're doing 30-odd knots on the boat in the cold. The barge's hull is reported to have been ruptured by the large swells over 10 miles out in the English Channel. Dover's all-weather 7 class has also been called out. We didn't know if the boat was already going to be sunk or if we could actually get there and do something to help. It does feel surreal, no doubt about it. You are rushing to someone's aid. It is a very, very powerful feeling. You're just hoping that the situation doesn't worsen on that, on that run out. You just love the boat to just be able to just push a few extra knots out of it, just to skip across that water that little bit quicker. After a 30-minute sprint out to sea, the warmer crew arrive as dawn breaks. The Dover crew are already on scene and the barge is still just afloat. But it's now right in the middle of the major shipping lanes. Over hey, lifeboat, one more lifeboat. Good morning, sir. Uh, any instructions for us? Over. It was in the, what we call the southwest lane, 
It, it's like a, a, a motorway. Probably the busiest ship lane in Europe. Not a place to take, start taking the water or breaking down. They put a lifeboat, a warmer lifeboat standing by, a warmer lifeboat out. Dover have transferred two of their crew aboard the barge to assess how much longer it might have before it sinks. And they found that the engine room was filling with water at the time the boat's engine was still ticking over. So they transferred their salvage pump on and, uh, and immediately started pumping the water out. If the barge's engine is completely submerged in seawater, it'll be rendered useless. And without power, the vessel will struggle even more to stay afloat in these rolling swells. The lifeboat crews must now do everything they can to lower the water levels below deck, which means placing three more of them aboard. It's not the first thing that we really want to do. By transferring a crew member onto the casualty vessel, we are then putting ourselves into the danger. But if that's what needs to be done, then that's what needs to be done. The warmer helm, Andrew, brings the Atlantic class up to the 60-foot-long barge and instructs Stephen, James and a member of the Dover crew to transfer across. But doing this in these conditions in the middle of the English Channel is a daunting task. You ready? Right away. It was rocking quite a bit because the shape of the vessel, trying to jump off and not get hurt or fall off, it's, it was quite tricky, yeah. Once the crews are aboard, the two casualties reveal that they're at the beginning of a journey from Kent to Northern Ireland, a sea voyage of over 600 miles. Old. She looked old. The kind of boat that you, you would look at and think, you know, you, you could see it sinking. I probably would give it another 45 minutes, maybe, and I think they probably would have been in quite a bit of trouble. But despite their boat's age and the danger they're in, the barge's crew both seem in surprisingly good spirits. They stayed in the wheelhouse. Uh, they was, remained calm. They wasn't panicking, panicking at all. The lifeboat crews know, however, that it's now a race against time to save this vessel. Being on that boat whilst it was taking on water was unnerving. You're stepping onto a sinking boat. Normally, you want to be stepping away from a sinking boat, not stepping in. Dover set their larger salvage pump to work in the engine room at the stern. The water is also pouring in from the bow, and the only way for Stephen and James to find out how badly is to get down below deck. We got about 10 inches of water here. Yeah. When we got downstairs, we saw there was about a foot of water down there. We didn't know, I suppose, at that time if we was going to win against it. This was the first job that we've responded to where I've, I've actually used a salvage pump. When working at full capacity, the salvage pumps can remove over 100 litres of water a minute. But the lifeboat crews can't stop the sea from surging in through the holes in the barge's hull. The only way they'll keep the barge from sinking is to continually man both pumps below deck. Being down in that galley is probably one of the most uncomfortable situations I've ever been in. We was in full kit, helmets on, visors down, and this water splashing around, and you can just smell, you can smell the fuel from the engine room. Horrible. Uh, you're in a confined space. That's probably the only shout that I've actually felt a bit sick on. It's just the boat's rocking. It goes from one side to the other. You're then dealing with a boat that's now taking on water with no nav lights, no engine running. And the time's just ticking and ticking. That boat could have started to go down. 
we were literally doing like 10 minute stints. One would be at the top making sure that the motor's still running whilst the other one's rolling around in the water underneath, trying to chase the water around. And it got to a point where we were changing every five minutes. After over an hour working the salvage pumps, the Warmer and Dover crews bring the seawater to a level where they can safely run the barges' engines. With its engine running, the lifeboats can now escort the vessel into Ramsgate, just over 10 miles away. The water was still coming into the boat, so both of our salvage pumps were, were still running at, at full control the whole way there. Three hours after launching, the lifeboats bring the old wooden barge into Ramsgate Harbour, and the warmer crew can finally return to station. I think it potentially could have ended differently. Had we have not been there, it could have most possibly been a very different story. The barge was taken out of water for repairs, with a view to its crew attempting the journey to Ireland again at a later date. It makes you very grateful for the constant training that we do. On that call out, everything came into play. There was lots of rope handling, lots of equipment use. It's just amazing that with a snap of a finger, all this training just kicks in. Nine months after he and his friend's children were caught out by the tide off Conway, Alex has still not ventured back into the sea. This event was very hard for family. The realisation that they could have lost us. My fiance and myself, we've moved the wedding forwards, uh, realising just how important uh, our time is together and, and how little time potentially that, that we all have. And in North Devon, Matt has put his sea kayaking aspirations aside for now. I've definitely got a lot more respect for the sea and the water now. Um, I realised I'm not quite as capable as I thought I was. And um, yeah, it took the events that day to show me that. But um, it hasn't put me off going to the beach, but certainly I've got new respect for the sea. Whoa! There was a lot of motion in the sea. It was going to be a bit of a challenge getting back onto the boat. Go! One, two, three. Hey, mate. He was cold. He was shivering. Scott, you want to go on board? Yeah. When he was getting dragged onto the boat, you could see that this individual was pretty limp. My biggest fear was leaving my children without their dad and my wife without her husband. 